Today's topic, the Bhagavad Gita for everyday living. In fact, the, the reason we have this topic is because everybody believes the Bhagavad Gita has nothing to do with everyday living, right? Hmm. I'm not joking. That's why we have to have a topic like this. See, we have these uh, Gita discourses that run a few days, you know, in India, especially. Even here, even in the US, we've done it. But in India, I'm telling you, which is the home of Vedanta, the average age for the discourse must be 75, 80. Now, something which is meant for your day-to-day -day living, you should learn it before you live your life or after it's over. You see, the whole thing is completely misunderstood. So hopefully today at the end of this talk, you will all understand or at least appreciate that in fact you cannot live without this knowledge. It should be the opposite. How can I live without understanding these basic principles? You can live. Everybody is living. Animals are living. Plants are living. What is the quality of life? That's what you have to understand. It's very, very poor compared to what you could be living if you understood these basic principles, which are not very difficult. So the Bhagavad Gita, just for some of you who may not be aware, the, the word Bhagavad Gita, Bhagavad of the Lord, Gita song. So it means the song of the Lord. Poetically, what it actually means is the message that an enlightened soul gives humanity for its benefit. In this case, it happened to be Lord Krishna thousands of years ago. So the Bhagavad Gita traditionally is considered a textbook. It's the most well-known textbook, but it's just a textbook of the Vedanta philosophy. This knowledge, this philosophy, this wisdom is called Vedanta. You can put that up. Veda Ananta. It's a Sanskrit word which is an amalgam of two words, Veda, which means wisdom, knowledge, Anta means ultimate, culmination, the end, the end of wisdom, the end of knowledge, the finality, the highest knowledge. And why it's the highest? You can say highest, anybody can call it that, but why is it the highest is because it fulfills your requirements in life at all levels. At the material level, emotional level, and then ultimately the spiritual level. So the Gita calls it in the 16th chapter, he says, these are the three ends of life. Siddhim, Sukham, Param Gatim. 
can put that up nilesh so siddham means you can see that on the board there success and achievement sukham happiness fulfillment and param gatim is the supreme goal the supreme happiness the finality which is self realization god realization so all three relative and absolute goals friends the gita the knowledge of the gita will help you attain so it's in your interest to listen and learn so just to give you a historical context since we are talking about the gita there's also a pun on the word vedanta so vedanta veda knowledge anta end also refers to the end of the veda so the vedas were the highest textbooks the earliest spiritual textbooks of humanity literally thousands of years ago and most of the veda the bulk of the veda there are four vedas consists of hymns praising the reality the divinity and rituals and their descriptions but only at the end which is in volume the smallest part the end part of each veda is called upanishad and the upanishads the end of the veda are the first textbooks that explain this philosophy the earliest spiritual treatises of humanity were the upanishads which explain what life is really all about so what happened is by the time of the gita now i'm putting the clock thousands of years after the vedas at the time of krishna and arjuna and veda vyasa the sage who compiled the gita the mahabharata what had happened is people had lost the spirit of the vedas completely and had become addicted to the non essentials which is constantly performing rituals in the hope of a selfish benefit which the gita demolishes so in the second chapter he says pushpitam vacham this flowery speech veda vada rata that people are speak of the vedas this is a flowery speech he says he actually says and what do they want bhogam aishwaryam they want nothing but pleasure and power in the world that's why they are doing all these rituals so the gita was an attempt to explain to people in those days look try and understand the meaning behind the ritual what is the philosophy behind it and periodically all these great masters have done that for humanity so if you go thousands of years after the gita and 1300 years before us about 800 ad there was another great saint adi shankara who had people no longer understood the gita this is 1300 years ago so he wrote other textbooks called the bhaja govindam atma bodha to introduce people to vedanta because they could no longer understand even the gita which itself is a diluted form of the upanishad and if you come now in the modern age i'm putting the clock back 60 years my guru is 95 now 96 this year and he found that people no longer understood even the basic introductory textbooks like the bhaja govindam so he made it his life's mission to write the entire philosophy of vedanta in a simple flow in english and that's the vedanta treatise the eternities which i teach you right on those of you who attend on saturday mornings it's an attempt 
to explain the whole philosophy in a way you can understand today. So, whether it is then or now, you may ask, then why do I need to understand this? You need to understand this knowledge, friends, because these are eternal principles of living. It's exactly like how you have to understand the laws of physics. You're on the eighth floor of a building. You can't say, let me jump out of the balcony. You're flouting the laws of physics. You'll, you'll fall, you'll die. You have to respect that law of gravity. You can't just jump out of a high-rise building, right? It's a law. Similarly, there are mental, intellectual, spiritual laws which you have to follow. And Vedanta is nothing but a treatise of those laws. It's called in Sanskrit, another word for Vedanta is Sanatana Dharma, which means the eternal principles. It doesn't matter if it was thousands of years or now. It's the same thing. Just as gravity applied then and now. These are laws. And you are flouting the laws. Nobody is learning these laws. This is the manual for life. If you don't have a manual, how can you live? You don't know how to drive, how can you drive? So that's why you find friends. I'm not being pessimistic. You look at the world. At the individual level, what is there? There is stress, there's addiction, there's depression, divorces. You find out everywhere. One, two or three or four people suffer from this individually. And at the world level, what do you see? You see terrorism, you see war, you see corruption. You see greed, which is literally tearing the world apart. So whether you take it individually, you take it collectively, it's a disaster. It's a complete disaster because nobody understands the basic laws of life. So let us try and understand today how this knowledge, these laws can help us gain these three things, peace, prosperity, and ultimately true fulfillment in life. That's it. So, if you look at the world, there's a very interesting paradox, right? You just see the world. You know, our academy in India is, is between two villages. Uh, it lies between Mumbai and Pune. So it's, it's a rural area. There are two villages on either side and you see them. They're very peaceful people. I was there for 10 years. I had the chance to, even now, some of you came, right? We took them because we built homes for our domestic workers. We built homes for them. So we took all of you, the people who came for the past retreat. And you could see, they hardly have small homes we've built and they are so peaceful. They are welcoming you. They would have fed all of us if it was up to them. With nothing they have. Peaceful. But you won't want to go and live there because there's no dynamism. There's no production. Therefore, there's no prosperity. So where you find peace, you don't find production and prosperity. And whenever you find action, you come to Manhattan, you come to Mumbai, there's action, dynamism, people are working. But what is their condition mentally? Completely stressed out. Worries, anxieties, blood pressure. So where there's peace, there's no prosperity. But they're prosperous because they work. Any country, any, any people that work, they'll be prosperous. So, the, what is going on? Minute you work, you get stressed. So, that's why what is the greatest entertainment all of you have? What is the thing you look forward to? Everybody. Weekend. I'm waiting for the weekend. 
I believe the new terminology now, Wednesday is hump day, you know. Hump day means your agitation goes up, up, up and middle of the week it's the highest. That's the hump, you know, like a camel hump. And then by Thursday it goes low, low because weekend is coming. So Wednesday is called maximum Wednesday morning agitation. There's a term now. There's a limit to madness also. And then by Friday you ask anybody, how are you? I'm hanging in there. Hmm? I'm hanging. What do you mean I'm hanging in there? Because one more day of this, I'll literally die. I need to, I need the weekend. So the minute you work, you get stressed out. Why? So the challenge is how do you combine the two? See, recently I got a call from a millionaire. He's a very, very successful man. And he was asking me, we had a philosophical, that's why he called me. Otherwise, it's a waste of my time to talk to these guys. Uh, he says, I have everything. So successful. I have a beautiful family. It's not that I have a problem with a divorce or my children. They're all fine. Then why am I still so agitated, anxious all the time? This is what I want to ask. Why? Why can't you combine success and still not be stressed. So the Gita says you need to understand how to do both. And that's the central theme there. So if you look on the board, if you in the second chapter, he says, Samatvam Yoga Uchyate, which means peace of mind is yoga. That's the 48th verse. And in the 50th verse, he says, says, Yoga Karmasu Kaushalam. Skill in action is yoga. Very interesting. He says, not only should you be peaceful, you should be skillful, expert, productive. And yoga means that commitment to unite with the self. Yoga comes from the word yuj, which means to join. So yoga means the spiritual disciplines to grow as a human being, which means action, karma, devotion, bhakti, jnana, knowledge. These are the real yogic disciplines, not what the West understands or even India now understands as yoga, which is the outer shell, the physical discipline, asana, which is the exercises and breath. These are all physical disciplines for physical fitness. I do them myself. I have nothing against it. But they have been marketed as complete spiritual discipline. What can you say? It's not as simple as that. The main part of it is completely unknown. That's what the Gita talks about. So exactly what that millionaire is going through today who I just had a conversation with is what happened in the Gita thousands of years ago. The millionaire or the successful person of today is symbolized by Arjuna of those days. Arjuna was a prince. Dhananjaya was his, his nickname. The winner of wealth. He had conquered the whole area Extremely wealthy, qualified, educated. But what happened? The minute he went to battle, he completely lost it. That's why the first chapter of the Gita is called Arjuna Vishada Yoga. The description of Arjuna's stress, despondency. Vishada means stress, unhappiness. Dejection. He was completely shattered. He tells Arjuna, he tells Krishna, my mouth is parched, my limbs fail me, I can't stand. So this is the condition of the modern human being, even today. They are not educated how to handle the challenges. And then by the end of the Gita, the 18th chapter, 73rd verse, this is what he said. 
my delusion is cleared and my understanding restored by your grace o achyuta i am firm with doubt dispelled i will do thy bidding that is the 73rd verse of the 18th chapter at the end famous verse nashto moha smritir labdhwa that delusion is gone so that's the effect of this knowledge you become clear you understand and you know what to do but to get there the first thing is to appreciate where you stand now see the problem is the same problem arjuna did you know what the problem is when arjuna went into the battle he started complaining to krishna about the external situation how can i fight against my own kinsmen which means this situation is causing me stress this is the wrong point and that's why krishna kept quiet he didn't say anything in the first chapter because he knew arjuna wasn't ready he was convinced that the problem was outside and that's why friends you don't get anywhere in life because all of you when i say you i mean humanity nothing personal everybody believes the problem is outside if i ask you what's your problem what will you say everything is great but that wife of mine hey but that husband of mine but my boss my children the economy the government does anybody say what is wrong with me and yet the truth is the whole problem is within you you have lost control of your emotions don't blame the world that's what the problem is so all the success all the money in the world will not help you if you can't control yourself so that's the starting point what is wrong with me i'll prove it to you i'm not just making statements it's quite straightforward see what is so once you understand that the problem is within it's not outside you'll tackle it now for those of you who don't know th- these are the basics so if you look at the board this is the structure of a human being see action is performed by the body and the body is just an outer shell your physical body what controls the body directs the body which is actually what you are is your mind and intellect you see that right the mind is your feelings emotions impulses the intellect is your capacity to reason to think now what happened to arjuna he came into the battle after planning the battle for 13 years remember that 13 years he was exiled he was planning for this day i am going to go there and finish these guys off and what happens the mind takes over his emotions and his intellect is too weak to control them he collapses so the stress is not outside it's your own emotion so ask yourself where are you stressed out where you've lost control over your emotions why do you blame the world see there's nothing wrong with earning money but you lose control it becomes greed greed stresses you out finishes you there's nothing wrong with enjoying a drink but you lose control you become an alcoholic that will finish you don't blame the drink don't blame money you've lost control so everything boils down to your own loss of intellect so all of you in this lecture i'm sure are very intelligent people 
I meet you, I meet you all, all the time. I ask you, okay, where I have PhD, I did a master's, I am this, I am a CEO, I am a the doctor, I am a lawyer, very intelligent. But I know there is no intellect. Hmm? Because intellect is a different aspect which you have not cared to develop. It's not that you don't have it. So what happens is, see I recently was introduced to a doctor, very intelligent man. He's lost his license because of alcoholism. He was caught giving prescriptions under the influence. Very intelligent, but no intellect. Life is a complete mess. Children have left him, his wife has left him. I mean, but very intelligent person. So you may be the most intelligent person. You've got an ego about that. Hmm? But you don't realize there's no intellect. So you see, right, last uh, few months back, 25 billion to zero. That fellow is a greed. He's under bi behind bars now. Crypto or whatever. And you see the resume. PhD in this big institution, this Ivy League, that, uh, what is the use? So, Vedanta develops your intellect and it is reason which controls emotion. And the problem is your own mind and your mind takes over, you don't know what to do. Everybody, it's a question of less or more. And that's what the Gita says in the third chapter. See that on the board. Oh, Kaunteya. Kaunteya is another word for Arjuna, the son of Kunti. Wisdom is covered by this constant enemy of the wise in the form of desire as insatiable fire. Dushpurena nalenacha. What you have inside you is a fire that will burn. Does any sample of fire say, enough, no more? That's your mind. How much ever you give it, burns for more. You own, literally own a whole country, you will put war on another country. It burns for more power. That's what's happening. You have all the money in the world. No, I want that. So, how do you gain peace? The first part of the lecture today is, how do you gain peace? How do you gain happiness? When your intellect is able to keep the mind in its place, at least relatively you are a peaceful person. So, like I said again, Vedanta is not saying you should not earn more. But don't let it go into greed. You will be peaceful. It's not that you should not enjoy the senses, but don't get addicted. Then you are in trouble. You will be peaceful. That's the intellect. So without that, you can't function in the world. It's not possible. I don't know how you are functioning. And then, like I said, the minute you talk about controlling the mind, people say, Ah, that means we don't have to earn more. We should be content. No, Vedanta is not saying that. Vedanta is talking about Siddham, how to be successful. See, yesterday a guy came for the class here and he was, he was I was telling him, Hey, your, I know your brother is with us. Why doesn't he attend? You know, He says, the minute I talk about Vedanta, he says, don't talk about that. A very successful banker in Manhattan. And this is the reason. They believe it will teach you not to earn more. That's why they are scared to death. You know? It's not that. In fact, with this knowledge, I'll explain to you how you will be successful. You'll do far better than what you're doing now. So that's part two, success. How do you gain success? See, look at the board there and follow carefully. What is success? Success is achievement. 
right? You achieve something in the future, you say I'm successful. Now, any achievement is a future effect and every effect has a cause. And what is the cause for future success is right action in the present. So when you say I want to be successful, actually what are you asking? Teach me how to be, how to do right action now. What is right action? And you will be surprised that all management emanates from the Gita. And it's just a few words which he, which he summarizes the entire right action. Put that up. Hmm. So in the 30th verse of chapter 3, the ideal action, what does he say? Renounce all actions in me. I'll explain what that means. With thoughts resting on the self, free from anxiety and attachment, fight without mental fever. Vigata Jwara, he calls it. This is ideal action. Renouncing all actions in me means you must work for a higher purpose. Renounce your selfishness and work for a higher purpose in life. That's the first principle of success. That gives you that power, that inspiration to work. When you're selfish, you don't want to work. You're forced to work. When you have an unselfish purpose, you are inspired to work. You don't look to run away. You don't want weekends. You want to work. You want to serve. And then he says, no worries of the past, no anxiety for the future. See, if the problem with why people are not successful, they can't concentrate in the present. But when you have a higher purpose, your mind becomes calm and you're able to concentrate. And when you concentrate, you achieve. I've spoken, I've given seminars to CEOs so many times, hundreds of times. I ask them all, how much of the day do you actually concentrate on the present action? In 10 hours you're in the office. They tell me, 3-4 hours at most. Rest of the time, worried about the past, anxious about the future. All that, this is exactly what tires you, you know. That's why you feel tired. It's not work which tires you. It's worries and anxieties. So this is the prescription for success. How should you be successful? This is the formula. In fact, he see, people believe. It's so sad, you know. I told you. One of the saddest things is everybody believes Vedanta is for retired people. It's not relevant for day-to-day -day life. It removes your drive to work. It removes your passion to work. Everybody believes that. You know what he says in the Gita when he talks about ideal action? Can you put that up? Remember this verse. The 25th verse. O Bharata, as the ignorant act attached to action, so should the wise act, unattached, wishing the welfare of the world. So he says, just as the ignorant people act selfishly attached and they go all out. Hmm. Old Manhattan, you see, I want to gain this. I, oh, you should also be like that. It's not that you should not work. But your purpose is different, unattached, wishing the welfare of the world. That's the big difference. But you should not stop action. So remember that in your field of action, work as much as the selfish fellow is working. But your attitude should be work for your organization, for your patients, for your clients, whatever field you're in. But don't work, don't stop work. So friends, you see how uh, practical this is. It's not against action. 
and everybody, especially in India, they believe. And for thousands of years, they stopped action. And the country deteriorated tremendously in terms of material achievement because of this misunderstanding. So peace you get through control of the mind, which is developing your intellect. Success you get through the right action, which again needs intellect. And finally, friends, all the peace and all the achievement in the world will not give you the satisfaction, the fulfillment that you really are looking for. That you have to understand. So, the whole Gita is sandwiched between two words. The Gita starts with the word Dharma, which means nature and ends with the word. The last word of the Gita is Mama. Last word is Mama, which means my. The first word of the Gita is Dharma, which means nature, essence, being, identity. That is Dharma. So what is the message of the Gita? Mama, Dharma, my nature. So beyond your body, mind, intellect, I showed you that diagram, right? That just showed your material equipment. Body, you know you have. Mind, you feel. Intellect, you think with. But beyond these three lies your real self, your true dharma, your essence. It's called Atman, Brahman in Sanskrit, consciousness. Reality, God in English. That is what you really are. So, you will find true happiness, fulfillment only when you get there. And you don't even have to wait till you get realization. Even the pursuit will give you far superior purpose and fulfillment than anything in this world. That I can guarantee, if you are really committed. 30 years I have been full time studying this, morning, noon, night. That much at least credit you should give. Hmm? 30 years is a long time, from 20 I am 50 now. So that much I can tell you. You will find the satisfaction far superior to anything in the world. And that's beautifully summarized in the 21st verse of the 5th chapter. So, see, these I'm giving you these important verses so you understand the overall message. It's not my idea. It's, it's, come, it's coming down for thousands of years. So, what does he say? Unattached to external contacts, one finds happiness in the self. Uniting yourself to Brahman by yoga, one attains Sukham Akshayam, the eternal bliss. So you don't have to wait till self-realization, that is eternal bliss. Even if you are unattached and look within, you will find true happiness here and now. And you may say, you keep your happiness, let me keep my life. You want to do that? You do it. But then this is the consequence. That's the very next verse. Because he doesn't want you to wait. Straight away he gives the next verse. It's 22nd verse. What does he say? For. Means if you don't. The enjoyments that are born of contacts are only dukkhayoni. Wombs of sorrow. They have a beginning and an end. The wise do not rejoice in them. So the problem with the world is two things. You, the reason you are attached to the world is it provides an instant pleasure. But that pleasure is a womb of sorrow. 
because the mind is insatiable you gain the pleasure and that desire grows even more so again you're back to square one it's sorrow and the second problem is that pleasure itself can't satisfy you because it's temporary it goes doesn't last that's why he says womb womb means you don't see the baby till it comes out right this is the problem with the world you don't see the sorrow until much later look at the choice of word dukha yoni he doesn't say it's sorrow is the womb of sorrow you don't believe me ask any fellow who married for a few years first what happened uh i fell and then after a few years i have fallen flat on my face right what is it? divorce rate is 70% what happened womb of sorrow first pleasure then pain everything is like that child you have oh my child after a few years you ask that for which school to go which college it just goes on see one guy is a true story again he came to me he was telling me very philosophical he said i moved heaven and earth i did all i could i took loans i, I took my children i didn't i gave up my own social life took them to this class that class most of the at least indian parents here they have nothing else to do the drivers cooks cleaners for the children right and finally i got my dream his dream not the child he got his child in an ivy league college he got admission right that was his 20 year dream and uh i said then what's the problem now he says you know what he's taken a music major in the in the college that fellow came home on first break playing the violin and this fellow's heart broke he thought he'll become a doctor a lawyer or a... now he says i have to support his violin and him now <laughs> never ending another person i'm giving you truth because it you believe it's right there it's the womb of sorrow again something comes up never ends another person the daughter is doing well but now she decided to marry a school teacher full depression what will happen to the children school teacher salary i said what's wrong with the school they have a problem they never end not just that friend you are you are assuming your life will go on do you know it you are subject to disease decay at any time death it's so fragile i know a couple i'm giving you true stories which have been accumulated over the years because it's all the time their 40 year old daughter dropped dead in front of them brain aneurysm just dropped dead have you ever heard anything another recent case the girl's mother just dropped dead out of nowhere it's so fragile you believe it will not happen to you it can happen to you me so there's a verse in the bhaja govindam which is not the gita another textbook i told you which was written much later it says that when you can you put that up water on a lotus leaf is extremely unsteady see water on a lotus leaf it just trembles little wind it will fall so is life unstable understand that the entire world consumed by disease and conceit is immersed in sorrow so at the mental level constant desire sorrow physical level constant disease you're fighting an emotional level that's the problem that arrogance conceit i know what i'm doing 
you will die but you will not learn this knowledge because you believe you know what you are doing. So that's what the Gita says. He says this is the two words describing the world in the 8th chapter. He calls it Ashashvatam. Ashashvatam means everything passes. It's fleeting. Dukkhalayam. It's the abode of pain. See, now you may be thinking how pessimistic. We came for optimism. The fellow is so pessimistic. I'm not... See, pessimism is when you see the sorrow, you don't have solutions. A Vedantin is you understand the reality. This is the reality. But there is a clear cut solution, which is Vedanta. Seek the eternal. Like, I, like he just mentioned, you pursue the self, you'll be happy till you get to that infinite state. So, what's your problem? So, remember, friends, this world is just constant sorrow, one after the other. Victor Hugo says that in Les Miserables. You know what he says? The perfect smile belongs to God alone. Only when you reach that infinite state can you say, I have that perfect smile. Till then there will always be something. Hmm? So there is a story about this horse, you know. And the horse was being, every day it used to be uh, pricked by a deer, you know, one deer which had very big antlers used to prick that horse, every day. And he used to try and, but it couldn't outrun that deer. So finally he saw one human with a bow and arrow and the horse said, went to the human and said, can you do me one favor? He said, what? I'll, can you kill that deer? It's how much it's troubling me. I'll be so grateful. Human said, of course I can. I have a bow and arrow, but I, deer is too fast. He says, don't worry, man. You come on my back. I'll take you. I can, I can run fast. Human said, then no problem. So the deer took, uh, the, the horse took the human and they killed the deer. And the horse was so happy. Then, uh, the horse said, can I drop you? He said, yeah, drop me to my village. When he, the village came, the horse said, no, get off. The villager said, are you mad? I never knew how convenient this is. Now you are my driver. So the horse got rid of one problem, which is the deer. And what happened? Second problem. This is the world. You believe just that promotion, just my child, just this, just that. There is no such thing. So the only way is to pursue the self. There is no other way. But the problem is you are seeing this world. See, I, I know philosophy you won't understand, so I'll end with one story, another story. Because I know you like guys all like stories, right? Hmm? So there was a wise man, and he was looking out from his balcony. And he saw a man far away looking for something under the street light. And that man was looking and looking and looking. And he said, poor fellow must have lost something valuable. Let me help him. So he went to the man and said, what have you lost? He said, you know, I lost my wedding ring. I'm going to be in serious trouble if I don't find it. He says, yeah, that's a big loss for sure. Let me help you. Let's start with where you first noticed that it was missing. He says, I noticed it right there. He points out to the dark bushes, you know, from where he's come. So you lost it there. Why are you looking here? He says, because there is light here. Hmm. Absurd, no? This is exactly what you are doing. What is Vedanta saying? 
Huh? Happiness is not in the world. It is in the self. And what are you doing? I'm finding happiness in the world. Why? Because that's all I know. I'm seeing the world. You're like that man looking for the ring under the light. So friends, just because you see the world, you experience the world, doesn't mean what you are looking for lies in the world. All of you are looking like God knows what he's talking. That's the problem. So these wise men come and tell you, the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna is telling you, look, it's somewhere else. Just because you're in the world, it's in the self. Right from the times of the Upanishads, Paramananda, Paramrita, this is the supreme bliss, the supreme immortality. Parimuchyanti Sarva, you are totally free from all sides. So don't worry, even if you can't understand that, at least start with control over the mind, peace, success in the world, and continue gaining the knowledge of the self. So the last verse of the Gita concludes this message. What does it say? Wherever Krishna, the Lord of Yoga is, and Partha, the Archer is, there arises prosperity, victory, glory, and sound policy. That is my conviction. This is the final verse of the Gita. Yatra Yogeshwara Krishna Yatra Partho Dhanurdhara right? So what he is saying is where there is this knowledge of Vedanta and the dynamic committed disciple like Arjuna. Arjuna was a man of action, a woman of action, whatever. There has to be dynamism and action on the side of the disciple, not sleeping. This combination is there. He says, Shri. Shri means prosperity, peace. Vijaya. Vijaya means achievement, what we talked about. Niti. Sound policy, clarity of thinking. Bhuta, glory, self-realization. So everything you get. Now what else you want? Hmm? So you will be dynamic, successful, peaceful, clear, and ultimately truly fulfilled if you are genuinely committed. So you got everything. Right there. So now, how do you begin? That is the thing, right? So, some of you who are already attending, you know, but the, many of you are not because there's a lot, I can see a lot many people who don't really attend regularly. So, the Gita, fortunately, is a textbook which you can start learning at any stage because it explains the philosophy in different ways throughout the text. So next week, which is next Sunday at the same time, I am starting the 16th chapter, which is called the divine and the demonical, the distinction between the divine qualities which take you higher and the demonical qualities which demean you. So in fact, it's a, it's a good place to start the study of the Gita. If you're not doing it, start it. 16, 17, 18 actually are very, very relatable chapters, even for a new student. So you can put that up, right? So that is on Sundays, I teach the Gita and it's taught verse by verse. It's not simply a lecture like this where you summarize. Every verse we study. And then on Saturday mornings, 
I teach the Vedanta treatise, which I told you at the beginning of this talk, was written by my guru. It's a foundational course of the Vedanta philosophy. And we are in the beginning section. The first section of the book is an introduction. First eight chapters, so we are only on chapter seven. So even that is a great place to start, Saturdays and Sundays, right? So we'll tell you at the end, if you're not registered, how to do that. These are open to anybody. You can inform your friends. And then these, of course, are online. We periodically meet up also twice a year in upstate New York in the Catskills, where I'm in May, which is next month, I'm teaching the Bhajya Govindam, the verse I quoted, right? It's a beautiful text. In September, I'll be doing the Upanishads. So this is something you should definitely consider. All of us get together and study together. It's a great place and it's a beautiful campus there we have. Uh, we rented out obviously. What else we have to announce? The fourth thing also. Ah, youth classes. So Ritika teaches the youngsters every two weeks. Once every two weeks on Sunday evenings. The ages are between 9 to 14. Okay. That's also useful if you have kids in that age group. Very, very important for them and finally all this information is on our website vedantausa.org so in your chat button you will get a link to our online weekly lectures as well as the website we'll end with that okay so hopefully this has been useful and you know now what to do Mario, thank you.